welcome to another edition of Mr. Nice Guy. I'm Ben Slowey. Today on the show, joining me, uh, man has been in a lot of projects for a very num for a many number of years. Uh, he, his current projects include uh, mini meltdowns. Um, he's uh, actually in the band Limbeck. Um, he's in a couple bands in Nashville where he's currently living. Uh, Fresh Basil and Baby Brains. <laughs> a lot of stuff, uh, but I'm excited to talk to him all about his uh, musicianship, his artistry, and why he does what he does. John Philip, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me back. You bet, man. I appreciate you. Thank you for bringing me the coffee. Oh, dude. Hey, cheers. cheers. Yeah, dude. Anytime, man. Mm. I, anytime I get a chance to have Collectivo, like I could have coffee at my mom's house, Yeah, but I'm like... Collectivo, this yeah. is a special treat. Yes, I don't get it anymore. Sure, right? Because uh, I don't know, is Collectivo like just Milwaukee, pretty much? Or it is, okay. yeah. And then I guess Dove bought Altera. Oh, so okay. you can have Altera in other places, but yeah. I don't know if it's the same thing or not. I'm sure. But in Nashville, we have Bongo Java. Mm. I don't know if you're familiar or not. I'm not super good. Really? Yeah, yeah. and Frothy Monkey. Oh, okay. The last time I actually had an espresso drink at Frothy Monkey, like I thought I was having a heart attack. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Is it like really, it's, really intense? Yeah, it's really oh. strong. I did not expect it. I remember I was like having coffee with my friend and all of a sudden like a half hour later, I was like, I looked at my heart rate on my Apple Watch and I was like, it says it's 168 Jeez. beats per minute right now. I'm oh. kind of freaking. <laughs> <laughs> the palpitations. <laughs> yeah, I used to. I used to work at uh, Starbucks, and uh, I used to start every single shift with a Trenta, which is like that, like That's thirty ounce, yeah, cold brew. And uh, yeah, like if it weren't for how fast, like you had, like I was moving at that job, like it's during the morning rushes, I would probably be, you know panicking like just having yeah having that like you existential that amount of caffeine if you're because like there's early shifts that you're doing oh yeah five six a.m yeah yeah and it's high volume yeah i was at the marquette starbucks so it was like uh, the i think it was the second busiest uh, location in the state crazy but yeah so um but i'm a, i'm a caffeine hound uh i'm i'm glad you brought me some because uh I was like the past hour, like I was just like you know, I was hit, I was crashing, you know. <laughs> well, hopefully, it's you're more awake. Now. I am. Yeah. I am most definitely. Yeah. Did you go to Marquette then? No, I went to UWM. Okay. Uh, I'm originally from the Chicago area. So, I noticed that on your Facebook, there's yeah. Illinois there. Yeah, South suburbs. Okay. Uh, Tinley Park area, uh, if you're familiar. I am. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I came here for UWM in uh, 2014. Oh, and nice. I've been here since. Yeah. So the hence the like over three hundred mutual friends that we have, you've, you've met a lot of people Indeed. over the years. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, dude. I mean, That's awesome. I mean, a lot of it did come from sort of uh, that infiltration of like the creative scene, the art scene, like getting to know different people, like uh, doing the breaking and entering stuff, uh, doing uh, the show, obviously, but. Yeah, man. I mean, there's a there's a lot of interesting uh, folks doing uh, all sorts of cool things. Out I here. miss that about Milwaukee, how tight knit it is. Mm -hmm. But also, I don't miss the amount of like small town drama that's also involved. Because oh, yeah. like, if there's something that happens in the crew of like the couple hundred people that are all tied together, mm -hmm. word spreads fast. Yeah. Oh yeah. I've been there. Absolutely. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, that is that is sort of like the the bane of like a lot of like living in that small city. Like, you know, here in River West is like such a tightly knit community and like everyone is familiar with everyone. Like everyone knows like which venues have what type of vibe and like, you know, it's, I mean, I love it a lot and I do really enjoy living here. Uh, people for the most part are very friendly, but yeah, you do, yeah. you do tend to like, uh, there's a lot of stuff that, you know, things circulate really oh, easy. Dude, absolutely. Yeah. You know, yeah. I actually used to live right down the block. Oh you know, word. Is Dino's still there? It just closed this past year. Oh yeah. So sad. There's that. There's kind of like that makeshift bar mm. right on the left of Dino's. I don't even know what it was called back in the day, but I actually lived in that bar for a oh, couple years. Oh, did you? Years. Oh, nice. Yeah, and that was pretty sweet. And then I lived on the other side, because that's Chambers. 
Yeah, right yeah, Chambers. Yeah, and then I lived on the other side of Chambers for a couple of years too, and then I lived by Fuel for a couple of years. Okay, so yeah. I, I had like six years of River West. Some tenure. Yeah. yeah. Dude, Dino's had the best pizza. Their pizza was so good. I think that's, that's what we would go there for. Yeah. Like fish fry, yeah. essentially. Yeah. I work at Company Brewing now, oh, um, yeah. and, um, you know, I really enjoy the shows there, and I like, I love our food, I love our beer. Um, there's a lot of dive bars in River West, but there's not a ton of, like, great places to eat. Uh, there's, like, not in terms of, like, the places here aren't good, it's just, like, there's a shortage. Like, there's only one place that's open late, like, to bar close, and that's Shawarma King. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah. There was, a, there was a lot more places that were open later back in the day. I, I wish, yeah. Well, I remember Ness and Dorma, too. I think they would do service to, like, midnight. Mm. For a long time, I don't know what it is like now. They have good sandwiches too, dude. That formaggio. Oh yeah, uh, I might have to return and get it. Highly, highly suggest formaggio. Formaggio. That's some dorma. <laughs> 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 yeah, man. Um, so uh, yeah, so John, uh, what we talk about on Mister Nice Guy, we talk love and fear, passion and creativity, and. Well, like all that. Great. <laughs> Great. Good. I'm so glad you do. Um, uh, yeah, man, I've appreciated, uh, you know, the, the pizza party 43, uh, liking all my videos and stuff. <laughs> I appreciate your support and that you have, uh, you know, that you were, uh, uh, so open to, uh, sitting, coming here and, uh, sitting to talk to me. So I guess for, to start, John, uh, where are you? Are you from Milwaukee originally? Or? Yeah, okay. I am. I was actually born in Kenosha. Mm. So I have a lot of like Illinois ties mm. over the years. Sure, right by and, the border. Yeah. Oh, yeah, totally. And like the 85 Bears were my favorite <laughs> team as a kid just because oh, yeah. they were so epic. And oh, Sweetness yeah. was like my favorite growing up. Mm -hmm. It's just there's not a player that on the field and off the field that defined being a, a hero in all oh, yeah. aspects. I'm yeah. sure I'm sure my dad would agree with you for sure. Yeah. 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 And then, you know, then I transformed to the Packers and every other Milwaukee sport yeah. when, I, when I grew up. But to avoid ridicule. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sure. I'm, I'm, do you like the Bears and the Cubs? I'm, I'm, I'm not, like, a big sports guy. I don't get, like, super invested in it. But I was growing up... Uh, I like. I mean, I was a Sox fan growing up, and I I, I like the Blackhawks a lot. Oh yeah, I love. That's I like hockey. Watch. Yeah, hockey's awesome. Yeah, but like growing up in Kenosha, I hardly remember those years. I mean, I moved when I was nine, and then I moved up to Grafton, just a suburb. Mm -hmm. It's like twenty minutes from yeah. there. Yeah, that's where I'm staying with my mom right sure. now. And you know, when I was little, I completely wanted to find every way to get out of that town because it's like mm -hmm. 8,000 people Milwaukee was 20 minutes away yeah and so you know my, my hopes and dreams and aspirations were like bigger than Grafton totally yeah. and so I tried to find every way to get out of there and you know right when I turned 18 I moved out and so I lived in Milwaukee for about 18 years mm -hmm. and I toured a lot mm -hmm. part of that like 16 yeah. 18 years or whatever I lived there and so I wasn't stuck in Milwaukee per se, because when I when I joined Limbeck, I mean we toured nine months out of the year, so mm -hmm. that that was intense. That was From like 2005 to 2008, I was just like gone essentially. Mm -hmm. I didn't live anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh uh, yeah. Which was which was nice, but you know, I love Grafton, and. I, I always like I always thought because I live in Nashville now I've been there for about five years mm -hmm. and I I'm so kind of planted in Nashville it took a while mm -hmm. I have a couple bands that I play in there now um, I I went to school I got my degree down there mm -hmm. I have a job that I've had for the last four years to help manage an escape room oh place. oh nice <laughs> <laughs> and it's cool. and it, now it's like since I finished school I kind of I think I have to get some more certifications. I'm, I went for human services and addiction. Oh sure. Yeah. So I want to help people, and that's that's a big passion of mine. I want to help people get sober, or you know, find whatever their their goal is to make changes, to make positive changes mm -hmm. in their life. Because I struggled a lot over the years with alcoholism, yeah. and I you know, drugs really weren't other drugs really weren't like my poison. I guess. Sure. But 
I, I really have to try to like put my foot to the gas like extra hard and try to find a career job now. Mm -hmm. So yeah. there's there's a lot of like uncomfortableness with trying to find something that is a good fit for me and that will help me grow and attain all my goals that I've worked so hard because mm -hmm. I've been sober for eight years now. So like, it's awesome. Thanks. Yeah, I, I'm I'm taking it very seriously, but now it's like it's. It's go time, but I'm really nervous because I, I'm, I like stress out really easily. Yeah. And now I have to find a career job, but I also want to like find that, that nice balance to where I could still create and make music and play shows mm -hmm. if I can. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, I, I want to be career oriented in this, but like, if, I, if I'm not making music and creating, I, I will like totally freak out or yeah. be just completely miserable. I'm the same way. I have to be. In creatively inclined at all times or at least have some kind of like goal oriented process going on otherwise yeah mm -hmm. like I got myself crazy too yeah so what what's your what's your medium that you like most um so uh, besides this um, I so I do um, a lot of so I, I freelance uh, music journalism uh, for breaking entering so I go to a lot of local shows uh, write up on bands and give them like artist spotlights, um, which I've really enjoyed. Um, That's awesome. We have great, great music out here for sure. Uh, so when I'm, but when I'm not doing that, uh, I'm either at work or for a company, or uh, I'm big into movies, I'm big into just music in general. I try to do a little bit of everything, kind of. I guess you know, I would love to travel a lot more, but I'm just not financially. Uh, uh, sound right now. Oh, yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, because when you travel, it's like if you go for a week, you have to take that week off of work. You don't have yeah, income coming in. Exactly. You have to, like food and lodging. Yeah, and... it's you know you sacrifice a lot. You oh know? yeah, yeah. But you know you only live once, and it's like totally. How much do you actually want to save? Mm -hmm. Or how much do you want to like feel comfortable? Because yeah, right. doing things and meeting people and being social and experiencing something like South by Southwest. Yeah. You'll remember that forever. Yeah. yeah. And you know that because, you know, for years you were gone nine months of the year. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? I've so. played South by, I, I tried to count this couple months ago. I tried to, because, you know, it's it's right around the corner. So I was thinking about South by and I was like, God, I, I think I played seven or eight South by's. Mm -hmm. And I had fun in a totally different way every time. Mm -hmm. You know, like yeah. there's, I actually played um, drums for Tommy Stinson for yeah. a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And we did a South by Southwest with him and we did seven shows in three days Jeez. with Tommy. And so that was wow. a whirlwind. Yeah, That was a totally different experience than mm -hmm. I've had with any other band. I mean, seven shows in three days yeah. anywhere is, quite the feet. Well, you're like playing up and down 6th Street? Yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Uh, I know you played, you played with a uh, Trapper, right? I did. Yeah. 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 That was, that was a pretty good long tenure until that's, he, he started trying to want to do more of a solo thing mm -hmm. and it's not like I didn't see myself where I fit there or he, you know, vice versa. It was just like, I, I was doing other things at that time. I started playing with Paul Collins mm -hmm. and I think he just wanted somebody that was more permanent. Yeah. And yeah. it looks like he's <clears throat> had more of a fluid lineup over the years since yeah. I left anyways. Like there's drummers coming and going, whoever fits or whoever can play shows or yeah. runs that he's doing. And I see that he's doing a lot of acoustic stuff too. Yeah. Yeah, he was my first break and entering show I ever covered, actually. Really? Yeah. Where was that at? Backroom. Ah. It was a lot of fun, man. Was uh, it with Rhett, or? Uh, like... Was it just him? Uh, no, it was, it was his full band. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, and uh, 1913 opened. Oh, Shout out to yeah. 1913. Was that Victor De Lorenzo's yeah. band? Yes. Yeah, I love him Janet. to death. Yeah, great dude. Shout out to Victor. Yeah, I, I got to interview them actually. Uh, uh, for I he th they invited me to his studio over on the east side, and I got to like sit and talk to them for a while. And like, yeah, he's such a kind man. Is it in his house? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I see pictures and videos and stuff all the time. He likes to like 
post where he's miking or yeah. what he's working on. Mm -hmm. He's he's such a creative guy. Yeah. You know, I, I'm I'm kind of upset that he's not in the Violent Femmes anymore because mm -hmm. I think he gave them like that element of like cool. Yeah. Not saying that the Violent Femmes aren't cool, but like. They're they're a little nerdy, and mm -hmm. I think Victor's like cool as hell. I mean, oh, he yeah. would play a lot of those performances wearing sunglasses and stuff. It's cool. Still dude. does. Yeah. Still does yeah. the show, the nineteen thirteen gigs with it too, and yeah, um, yeah, like. Uh, but <clears throat> um, going back to South by Southwest, I know that uh, Trapper. Uh, I know he, he did. You play with him at all when you were down there? Yeah, I did a couple with him actually. The yeah. first one we did was surprisingly and shockingly amazing because we were we were on tour with the wallflowers the the kind of like the like early winter before leading up to that south by mm -hmm. and then he, the wallflowers were on tour with eric clapton when we were doing south by nice. and they were playing they were opening and playing early and then jacob and his people were like hey um i see that you're playing their, their sound guy jimmy had this barbecue restaurant called friedman's oh cool which is no longer around anymore but at that time they had this like really huge outdoor patio and they were doing like south by southwest day parties and they were doing night shows yeah but he found out that we were doing one of jimmy's shows and he was like i want to come and play a couple songs with you guys beforehand and we were like yeah that that sounds great and he's like yeah, yeah i'm also going to bring um rami who played in the wallflowers and he's also on the food fighters now Wow. So he, he's cool. like, I want to bring Rami, and then I'm going to bring Charlie, who was playing. He, he was played guitar with Bob Dylan for a long time. Oh, sure. Wow. And so we we're like, um, yeah, like all three of you come, that'd be great. So then we played uh, One Headlight and The Weight by the band. Oh, nice. With them, and I, I think like, we had a really good crowd. And then once Jacob showed up and and everybody, and we started playing, like people started filtering in, and then it was like like a crazy really fun crowd and awesome. so that was that was a memory like i'll remember forever oh yeah that's sure and it's documented on youtube and stuff it's kind of fun to, like, cool. when i think about it i'll just go back and watch it and you should send me the link i'd love to see it absolutely yeah you'll you'll never know what you run into there oh yeah i met narguar oh really yeah i've actually I met him both times i went uh the first time was because that was when i that was when i had the badge uh, the first time, and I got to go. That's and, pretty fun. Yeah, and I got to go to like his video vault like uh, session, and I asked him what his most hostile interview was. Maybe Blur. Blur was up there, <laughs> but it was actually Skid Row. Apparently, well, that interview doesn't even you can't even find it anywhere because they like smashed his camera. Yeah, and they like took his hat and like threw it. Like across the room, and was like, that like intentionally, or was it like? I guess so. Like, yeah, they. That's like, a shame. He's one of the best interviewers in the world. That dude is like, he's one of my biggest uh, influences, actually. And he's so insanely knowledgeable. Yeah, it's it's crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's such a nice guy. Yeah. He's just like a very big nerd. And Love he's giving you literally free stuff of, like, <laughs> the music you listened to, like, when you were discovering what music even was. Like, he'll pull yeah. out, like, records from the 70s and be like, yeah, you really liked this back in the day. You were in a band with this person who's on this record. I'm like, dude, the dude is like, uh, you know, he is just essential. He's a bona fide machine in... Uh, like doing interviews in such a like creative and eccentric way. Oh yeah, yeah for sure. I, I was actually really sad seeing that Blur interview. I, I never saw it, but then my friend Nick Moss, who plays in that band, Kevin Kevin. Oh, shout out to Nick Moss. I love Kevin. Dude, he's he's one of my best friends, uh, and he's such a sweetheart. Very good. Dude, he's yeah. unbelievably talented. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if you know it about him, but you could like literally give him any instrument, mm. and he's like a wizard. Oh yeah, he was, uh, he was he was like doing serious gigging when he was like fourteen, fifteen years old. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, he's kind of a prodigy, <laughs> and he'll not believe that when anybody <laughs> tells him. But yeah, we were talking about Nardwar, and he said something to the effect of like. Yeah, I just really don't like Blur after seeing that interview. I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, y you have to watch it. It's mm -hmm. It'll like make you feel 
sick. Yeah. It's so crazy. Yeah. And it's really the drummer. I mean, I think the other guys are just kind of like messing with him for whatever reason. Uh, it was but Dave Roundtree. Yeah. Like, he was like, he had a really bad, like, coke problem at the time. And, like, uh, and he actually did end up apologizing later oh, on. And good. Darkwater, like, accepted the apology via Twitter. But, yeah, it is still, it is still cringy to watch, you know, yeah. when, and so also with Sonic Youth, how they treated him. When, oh, I didn't see that. Oh, yeah, they, like, roughed him up a little bit when he tried to interview with them in the 90s. That, what's wrong with people? I don't know. Somebody who wants to just talk to you about your art and what yeah. you're doing, and right. that's insane to me. That'd be like us getting in, like, a crazy argument. Exactly, right yeah. <laughs> Crazy. That'd literally be like if you just like <laughs> took something off of this table and just like threw it at me, you know? <laughs> yeah, it, it 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 blows my mind like how people can be just so, you know, can just completely like, you know, disregard somebody trying to like, you know, show other people how cool what you do is, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. I, I don't get it. You know, I don't get it. Well, I, I hope you get to meet him again. Down I there, hope so too. He's there. Stay Shout tuned. Stay tuned. Shout out to Nara <laughs> about the human server yet. So, um, so John, uh, I'm curious because you've been playing music for so long. What was like your first band? Your first ever band? My my first band ever was this band called Trailfez. Mm. Do you remember the Jetsons? Oh yeah. That card, yeah. Yeah. The I, apparently Astro the dog apparently his original name is Trailfez. Oh, okay. Where there's an episode that me and my friend Kevin watched. We didn't know what to call our band. We called it Instep mm. at its first inception, where it was just that we were just a two piece because we didn't have a bass player or anything at that time. And then we found out that Milwaukee had like a gay culture music uh, magazine called mm. Instep at the time. Mm. And not that like we were against it, but we we're like, oh, there's a magazine called that. We have to be a little more original. Yeah. So then we were watching the Jetsons, and Astro's original owner came and was like, I want my dog back, Trailfez. We thought it'd be funny. And then like looking back at it, we're like, oh my god, we had a, a punk band called Trailfez. <laughs> but that was like. That was like very misfits, and we were into hardcore stuff like Integrity and Earth mm -hmm. Crisis. Oh sure. And when we were like fourteen, yeah. And he was thirteen at the time. Okay. So we did th we did that like a lot of high school, and then I actually I stopped playing drums for a couple years, and <laughs> I'm kind of revealing crazy things here, but um, I you know that band Fish. The hippie oh, yeah, band. Of course. I got really into like the not like hippie culture, but like I, I loved traveling around and going to different shows. Like I started going to like dead related shows. Oh yeah. And I started following fish a little totally. bit. Yeah. And so I kind of just got out of playing drums. Hmm. And then uh, my friend Ben Pearlstein, he found the Benjamins and started playing with them and then kinda nudged me into the band. So that was like my first serious band okay, after Trailfez. Sure. Sure. <laughs> nice. I see. What was this uh, 90s? It was, yeah. Yeah. Trailfest was like 93 to 96. Okay. And the Benjamins were like 98, 99. I see. Like well, okay. I also played in a couple other punk bands, like this one called Shaft, but that was really short lived. Oh, okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so then, like, uh, how would you say, like, because uh, that was, you know, over two decades ago, like, what was like different about Milwaukee's music scene at that time versus how you've seen it evolve and how it is now? Would you would you say? I would say that the Globe being around on North Avenue that was like essential to the local scene back in the day. Okay. When I when I first started playing the Globe, um, I actually also was in this band called Spank Child where I played guitar in it. That was like a pop punk band. It sounds like a spank child. That sounds kind of pop punky. <laughs> yeah, we I mean, just like it was like Green Day worship sure. kind of stuff. Nice. But then we we started playing the Globe, and that's when like I really found out about how to like play a show, and like you just you don't know the like the level of professionalism you don't you want to partake in, you know? Yeah. But when you're playing like Legion halls, there's there's no like set time that the bands are starting that. The show just has to be over by a certain time, mm -hmm. right. essentially. So it doesn't matter. Like bands can play fifteen minutes, yeah. and then on to the next band. Those 
those Legion Hall shows were like six bands, I remember back mm-hmm. in the day. So the the music scene back in like the late nineties, I the Globe kind of ruled everything for me and my friends. They they had all ages shows mm. and then they would do drinking shows after nine. Oh sure, yeah. And it was it was exciting for me because I, I was like really seeing these bands and, and like Alligator Gun. Dude, I just, uh, uh, speaking of Alligator Gun, I didn't know who they were until uh, I interviewed, I saw the cutouts oh, okay. this past week, uh, and uh, they were really inspired by Alligator Gun. Cutouts are a pretty cool band, too. Awesome. Mm. Well, that's, that, I mean, dude, Alligator Gun is such a throwback, so yeah. somebody's trying to pass the torch. Yeah, early to some Listens, yeah, damn. <laughs> that's that's awesome. Yeah. I, but like the promise ring were around then too. Mm-hmm. And Hey Mercedes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then the Hey Mercedes kind of like I think they were like early two thousands, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um but just having having like the Oakland house around too, the that was like a basement venue on Oakland. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And that's where I, I saw like Propagandi play <clears throat> on the How to Clean Everything tour in a basement. Yeah. I saw Anal Cunt in a basement in Milwaukee. <laughs> so like I, I was going to a lot of basement shows or going to shows at the Globe. Sure. And then the but then the kind of the scene got weird because Shane Call and the Globe had this big battle to mm-hmm. where like Peter Jesperson from Shane Call would call the cops on the Globe for not having the right license for all ages shows so then the all ages show would be shut down and then leo would kind of in retaliation do something to shank hall so there was like a lot of drama around then so that's that's when i started like really liking going to basement shows yeah. more mm-hmm. and there wasn't a whole lot of venues to be honest oh sure the shorewood legion hall i think at that time was having shows and everything was like real cd or cassette tape driven back yeah. then Mm-hmm. There's, there wasn't a lot of vinyl, really. Yeah, that didn't make a... That, not till like, the last decade that really made that, like, splash comeback, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Damn. Well, that would... I mean, that would make sense. I mean, now, like, uh, <clears throat> there's, like, a pretty good influx of DIY spaces that exist now. Like, one would even say that earlier in the decade there were even more DIY spaces but I would say like you know since I've been going to shows um, like there's a pretty thriving DIY scene and they're working tirelessly to bring those all ages venues back too yeah it looks like Cactus Club Kelsey Kaufman just bought the Cactus Club yeah yeah do more all ages shows and then X-Ray Arcade yes X-Ray, uh, which you're playing this weekend. Yeah, that, that show on Friday is all ages. Yeah, yeah. That has awesome. to be over by 11. <laughs> right, yeah. Arcade games, right? Yeah, yeah. Which, which is not a bad thing, because if everybody can get into the show and it's over by 11, then you're not getting home at, like, 1 a.m. Oh, I, I don't yeah. like that that much, you know? Like, going, like, staying out till bar closed for a show, like, it's... It's exhausting. It's pretty taxing. Yeah. And, you know, the, the crowd, I think, for the bands tends to filter out later in the night, too. So, like, nobody mm-hmm. wants to play exactly last at a drinking show because the crowd will thin out. People are going home or mm-hmm. they're too drunk at that point or something. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> right. Like, a lot of a lot of River West shows go pretty late. Like, at Bremen and High Dive, like, company, like, they go pretty late. But I think that's also because, like... It's such a localized scene here where, like, everyone is just walking to their house, like, a couple minutes away, you know? yeah, totally. As opposed to, like, everyone has to go across the city for a Cactus Club or X-Ray show. Um, So, Limbeck playing for the first time in 12 years, you said. Yeah, it's not not our first show in 12 years. It's we're playing Milwaukee and Chicago. Oh, I see. Okay, sure. Yeah. So we we played shows, I think, about four or five months ago. We did the Troubadour in Hollywood, and then we did Long Beach, and then way before that, um, we played some... We did it, like, three years before that, we did a little run with Piebald out west. Oh, sure. So sorry if if I relayed information. No, no, thank you for clarifying. Sure. Um, But it's our first Milwaukee-Chicago show in 12 years, and it's... 
it's crazy to even think about because I was 28 years old at that point. Mm -hmm. And so like if we don't play Milwaukee or Chicago in another 10 years, like I'll be playing in when I'm 50. Yeah. Which is insane to think about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Damn. Uh, the way the way these shows came about was uh, Nick Woods from Direct Hit. Have you met him before? I know of him, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. You got to have him on. Yes, I will. I'm looking for you. He's an interesting Woods. dude. Yeah, for sure. Um, he, I've been friends with him for a very long time. He was in this band called The Box Social uh, back in the day, and we did a lot of shows together. And then I was kind of part of Direct Hit's first management team. Nice. Uh, inadvertently. I, I didn't know how I got into that. Nick kind of offered for me to step in and help do things and then I got my friend Ben Perlstein involved who really knows how to manage but I, I was instrumental on, on getting Ben involved and then also like helping with Brainless God putting that record together because it was a concept record and then it they were making a video for every track on the album they needed a producer for it because they didn't want just like anybody just engineering or producing it so I got Mike from All American Rejects involved Awesome. And then now he does every record with them. And then awesome. he went on to do the mini meltdowns, latest seven inch. Yeah. yeah. But um, Nick was playing a direct hit show in Nashville at the end, which is kind of like a sketchy like venue in Nashville yeah. that still is like on the punk side of things. Okay. Which is great. Like yeah. They have nothing but punk shows essentially. Wow. So direct hit was playing there with uh, Masked Intruder and some other bands so I don't sure. remember but when I went it was in September last year and him and I were just outside before the show started just talking catching up and he's like yeah my friend uh, who who owns HVAC pub in Chicago wants to have a really like interesting bill put together for a show and direct hits gonna play there yeah. would Limbeck want to play with us he was just like kind of like throwing the idea out to me and I'm like I'm like well I'll ask the guys we, we haven't like, we don't play Midwest shows really anymore because yeah. they're so busy. So he's like, well, if you guys can do it, just use all our stuff. We'll, you know, we'll split the, the guarantee down the middle. He's just like, every, every, everything will be taken care of. You don't have to promote the show. Just use all our gear. You know, just fly with their guitars. It'll be super easy. So I approached the guys about that, and they were like, oh, yeah, done. Let's do it. We nice. don't have to worry about promoting or figuring out gear wow. or anything like that. Or the stress of like doing a headlining show where we haven't played these cities in 12 years. Yeah. So Nick is very instrumental in just like getting us together for this. And now it's like I get to do this podcast with you yeah. and Limbeck's doing uh, this video podcast thing where it's like we, it's called The Rock Room. Oh yeah, sure. The I've Smoking Pope's it. drummer, Mike, runs it. So we're going to do like a video performance on Friday That's for cool. that. So it's all kind of snowballing. Thanks, Nick. It's exciting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> That's super cool. That's mm -hmm. really exciting. Um, and so <clears throat> those guys, the Limbeck guys, all you said live in California now? Yeah, yeah. Pat and Rob live in California. Justin lives in Phoenix. Mm. Then me in Nashville. Very spread out. But yeah. it's always been that way. I lived here the whole time I was in Limbeck mm. when they were all in California. So we would just... You know, if we had a month or two, two months, two were coming up, they would just fly me in. We'd rehearse for a couple of days and then leave. Oh, sure. Nice. Well. Nice and easy. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's really exciting. That'll be a, that'll be a hit on a, a der no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, mini meltdowns. Uh, I was listening to your new EP just now uh, that came out Thanks. a couple months ago. Yeah. Really good. It, was, it is really a really well produced for sure. Thanks. Man. Yeah, I, I really worked hard on that one. Yeah. Yeah. When I first put the band together, I I didn't really know what I wanted to sound like exactly. I never wrote any of my own songs before, so I didn't know what my sound was going to be like. Mm -hmm. um, and so the the first EP is real piecemeal. Like we recorded it at like four different studios. Yeah. There was a whole different member involved in the band too at the time that would sing a couple other songs mm -hmm. and then she left so then this gave me like 
the free reign to like, okay, now I have direction for everything, like the art, yeah. the way everything sounds. Mm -hmm. So that's when I started talking to Mike and I asked him if he wanted to produce it. And he was just like, dude, come next month. It, like we'll take however long it needs uh, yeah. let's get it done mm -hmm. and Mike Mike's turned into a really good friend of mine he uh, he's when the All American Rejects were doing a lot of touring still they took Limbeck out a oh, lot nice. they were really friendly to us but we were also label mates with them oh, too sure, so yeah. it was pretty easy mm -hmm. and um, doing that EP I basically just I went to Mike's house for a whole week and I mean, I, I played essentially every instrument on it except for Scott from Dashboard and Promise Ring and yeah. Alligator Gun and Alligator, right. plays bass on it. And then Mike does like a couple extra things, yeah. like guitar and some vocal stuff. Yeah. Shout out to Scott and shout out to Mike. Um, that's yeah, yeah. Like I was reading a little bit about like the backstory of the EP and how oh, like 2018 was a uh, difficult year for you. It was, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, the the girl I moved down to Nashville for, the uh, the relationship just didn't really work out, mm -hmm. and so that was a big bummer. I was so I was kind of like in limbo. I'm like I'm all the way down here. Yeah, I might as well make the best of it. Yeah, kind of thing. But then I my dad got sick with cancer and we were really close mm -hmm. he was super young you know he got diagnosed when he was 61 mm -hmm. and Rough. with all of that that helped or not helped but that kind of created all this other like anxiety for me and i like it was it was i was just a wreck essentially mm -hmm. and then i got sick myself and it was nothing like terrible where I was gonna die or anything, but like I, I got chronic sinusitis. Oh. I, I never knew that was a thing, mm -hmm. but apparently it was like my sinuses are super screwed up and then my allergies were exacerbating everything. And then I got pityriasis rosea, mm -hmm. where it's like this virus where you have a rash all over your body oh. and like extreme fever oh, and fatigue. That's so like it was like that damn. and then I lost my dad and then I had to have surgery damn. and so it was it was just horrible <laughs> yeah that is a lot of like that is definitely a lot of tribulations for in such a short amount of time for sure mm -hmm. yeah um, so the songs I was writing at that time you know I, I never like set out to write like sad topics or depressing songs yeah but like I was just writing about the things that were on my mind at the time. So mm -hmm. it was like one song is about losing my dad. One song is about like where I'm, I mean, I wasn't like going to hurt myself or anything, but like I was pretty close to being like, man, I'm, I, I'm about to give up. Yeah. I'm uh, about to wave the white flag and be like, okay, I've had enough. And then, so one song is kind of about that, but like, you know, the strength of overcoming yeah. that, that feeling. Yeah. And then one is about anxiety, where I feel it, and especially in 2018, like I had to get on a couple of meds for anxiety and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. But that song largely is about my fiance who got diagnosed with general panic disorder, anxiety, and then also agoraphobia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like, I kind of wanted to write a song from her perspective with knowing that I know what anxiety feels like too. Totally. So yeah. that, that was a lot of fun to, to write that song because I started writing it and then I showed it to her and I needed some more lyrical lines and she kind of stepped in and like wrote some of the things oh, that she was huh. feeling. So I kind of incorporated that stuff sure. in the song. So it was like a collaboration together. Awesome. So That's wonderful. That was really fun. Yeah. I feel you on, uh, on the anxiety, uh, on a personal level. Um, <clears throat> I'm on meds too. Oh, okay. You know, uh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. You it know, <laughs> it, it does. It, man. it does suck. Uh, you know, like especially when you miss a dose. Mm. That's, that's the worst thing ever. Um, but yeah, luckily, I yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have an alarm on my phone that reminds me to take it every morning. But yeah, like I have a, a anxiety with like uh, obsessive compulsive tendencies and whatnot. Oh. Um, and, uh, 
Yeah, so, I, and I think that it's very constructive when you can funnel that anxious energy into something that forwards you emotionally. So for you, writing songs and, you know, having, especially with the kind of sound that you're producing uh, with this project, like, it is very, like, you know, fast-paced and, you know, loud and, you know, it's stuff that I feel like a lot of people, no matter if they're older, younger, like, no matter what age, like, anyone could probably relate to that emotionally. Which Thanks. is great. Yeah, yeah that's, that's kind of what I'm trying to do, you know. I, I want to create a universal sound that people yeah. can... And, and uh, songs that people can relate to. Yeah, yeah. Because playing with all these artists over the years, you know, whether it be Trapper mm -hmm. or Tommy, Paul Collins, like you yeah. see the way these people write and put together songs, and everybody writes differently. You know, like Trapper tends to write more like storytelling songs. Yeah, right. Which I, I like Trapper's music a lot, but I don't think that a lot of people sometimes can connect with his songs because the one song is about him having a bad back, one song is about his grandpa, how he had like a century ago had to live a winter yeah. like digging a hole in the ground and flipping his his wagon upside down because yeah, he's tra yeah. is traveling across country. Mm -hmm. So like the the stories are really cool, but I always thought like man for somebody to listen to the song and try to connect to it and everybody makes their own yeah. kind of narrative in, right. in songs and they get different things out of them but I kind of wanted to try to write songs where like somebody can hear them and be like man we've all dealt with anxiety oh, yeah. we've all lost a loved one in some sort of way mm -hmm. we've all felt like uh, giving up on life oh, yeah right getting yeah. sick you know like to like to varying degrees everyone can relate to all of those things and um yeah so <clears throat> Um, yeah, like, so uh, what are you working on now with the project? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, I, I want to play more shows. Not like a ton more, just because getting a lineup and practicing and, and doing that whole thing, not that like I'm lazy and don't want to do that. It's just like finding the right people that will be the right players for it mm -hmm. that I'm comfortable with. I think I have a few ideas for people in Nashville that could play. So I do want to do some shows, maybe not right away, but like work on it. Maybe do a couple shows over summer. Cool. But in the meantime, I'm going to take this whole year and work on full length. Nice. And not record the full length, but at least like demo some songs out. I, I've already been writing a whole bunch and I've kind of loosely demoed out some songs. But it has the same kind of like punkish, upbeat feel. Yeah. And a lot of the songs are already, you know, around the, the, the same kind of subject matter. Yeah. This one that I've been working on is called Tired of Pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. <laughs> and, you know, everybody everybody feels pain. and Emotional it, pain, too, you know? Mental pain. That's it's totally just, what it's about. Yes, right, yeah. yeah. Your, your project is aptly named for the kind of music that you're making. Thanks, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I, I tried to have... Because when I was piecing together what I wanted the band to sound like and what my songs were going to be, of course, naming a band sucks. It's like, I mean, like you, you look at other bands, and first off, like finding a band name that's not ta that's not taken, totally it's difficult. Yep. And then also naming a band that's actually something that's cool is pretty difficult too. Yeah. Like you know, you, you look at bands like that have names like like Vampire Weekend. Yeah, right. Like <laughs> yeah, yeah. okay, what does that mean? What is that? Like and also the the band name would be a lot cooler if it was called Vampire to me. Yeah. <laughs> or uh Death Cab for Cutie. Death like Cab what does that Cutie. mean? You know? I, like one day I hope I can ask Ben Gibbard what that means. But but like yeah, it's so it's very esoteric where it's like mm -hmm. it might just mean something to the person that like they, it could just be like a collage of words or concepts that no one else can like really imagine like what they were what was going through their mind yeah. totally yeah so when when i came with mini meltdowns i was really stressed out at the time this is like three years ago and i think i was having an argument with somebody over something stupid probably mm. and had like a crazy tantrum of sorts I, i'm probably thinking yeah. and then I, I was like god these like mini meltdowns are, are like i gotta like learn to chill 
And then I was like, oh, that would be a really cool band name. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, it's good. I mean, Thank you. Yeah. I, like I said, it, it echoes the, the, the subject matter you tackle in a lot of songs, so it makes sense. Um, so how about these bands in uh, Nashville that uh, you recently joined? So Fresh Basil and uh, uh, Baby Brains, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah tell yeah. me about these projects. Yeah, I, I met up with these guys from... There's this Wisconsin guy, Max Frechette. Mm. He, uh, I, I didn't really meet him in Wisconsin. He's from Wisconsin originally, up from the Fox Valley. Okay. And he lived in New York for a long time. Mm. And when I did, when I was playing with Tommy Stinson, we did a residency at Bowery Electric, which is, which is Jesse Mallon's club, which is essentially next to CBGB's, where it used to be. Okay. Which is now CBGB's is a John Bravado store. I see. <laughs> In the Bowery, yeah. So we're we're doing a, a residency there for a month. We're doing like one Thursday a month, mm. and it was awesome. But one of the bartenders, this kid Max, I, I, he looked kind of familiar, and I was playing there every week on this residency. So I got like more and more friendly with him, and then by the second week I was there, we were like, "Do, do we know each other?" Like. And then I think somebody, you know, we must have put our names in Facebook and we're like, oh, okay, you're yeah. from Wisconsin. And then we like knew all these people that were in common. So we kept in touch over the years. Mm -hmm. And he made this friend, Amanda, that lives in Nashville, who is, is baby brains, essentially. Okay. It's her moniker. And they were looking, kind of loosely looking for another drummer. And Max pointed her my way. And... I was going to a Hold Steady show in Nashville, mm. and when I was going there, I was like, hey, let's meet for coffee and talk, and we ended up talking for like an hour, and where we were just like going to talk for like maybe 15 minutes before the show. And we ended up talking for like an hour, and we had all this in common, all this like musically in common, but then also we discovered that we're both sober, and so mm. she's in the program. We were like, okay, like you... you are sober, I'm sober, we're both in the program, we both like the same exact music, she's yeah. super friendly and, and really cool. Awesome. So she was like, okay, let's get together and jam. So it, it worked out awesomely, and that's like kind of like 60s garagey kind of sounding stuff. Oh, fun, yeah. It's been really fun. And then the guitar player of that band, this guy Justin, he's from Philly, mm. as is Amanda, she's from around like the, okay. the Pennsylvania area originally. Sure. Justin has this band called Fresh Basil, and so we jammed, and he's like, all right, yeah, this is working out real good, so we're going to like put a thing together. Nice. Fresh Basil. Fresh Basil. Yeah, I like that a lot. He's a, he's a cool guy. He also plays um, bass in this band called The Minx. <clears throat> They're from Nashville. They just played in Milwaukee a couple oh, cool. months ago at Dude. that Pabst Brewery oh, thing. Oh, have you been there yet? I haven't. Oh, it's a fabulous venue. Yeah, yeah um, I heard it's cool. Very ornate. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, it's uh, kind of like a new, sort of like that, like that very like uh, hip up and coming like startup section of the city. Um, yeah, it's it's beautiful for sure. It's got to be difficult to park. Oh, it's there. the worst. Parking there is the worst. Okay, that's the only thing I have to say about it. <laughs> but it is a nice venue. We have our breaking and entering uh, monthly. Uh, concert series there okay cool we just had dramatic lovers oh month. yeah i love those guys they're so good yeah i love that. so so biju helps book that past venue oh yeah yeah and so i was putting together a good land records 10-year anniversary because in october is our 10-year anniversary mm, that's exciting uh, so it's that 10 years have, have seemed like a year to yeah me crazy yeah right yeah <laughs> so i'm putting together this 10 year anniversary party with like four bands good land bands mm -hmm. and initially i was talking to bijou to book it there and he you know we were green lighted and everything and then i was i was thinking i'm like god what's the parking situation like down there and i talked to a few people and they're like yeah parking is a nightmare and I'm like, well, I, I don't want anybody to be detracted yeah. to going, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So then I talked to my friend John Revord, who owns Boone and Crockett oh, and, sure. and the Cooperage and stuff. 
And he was like, oh yeah, yeah, let's let's do it. And I've been trying to do a show at the Cooperage forever. Also very great venue. Oh, it's beautiful there. So it's, it's booked there, and there's going to be a couple of surprises at that. And so nice. I'm, I'm working on it. It's going to be in November. Okay. So we've got some in... We've got quite some time to anticipate everything. Yeah. But that's exciting, man. That's awesome, dude. Awesome. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so that would be, I guess, uh, uh, last thing I wanted to talk about is Goodland Records. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, I never saw myself starting a, a small business mm -hmm. ever, first off. And then I never saw myself starting a label because, like... Starting a label in these times right now yeah. with like downloading, yeah, right, and music sharing and streaming, yeah, it right. just sounds like a crazy thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, starting it ten years ago, streaming wasn't as prominent mm -hmm. at that time, and vinyl was really starting to kick up again. Yeah. So starting it with with one of my friends that I grew up with, he had an idea. He was like, "Hey, I I have some extra money." and I want to put it into something artistic. And he's like, I've always been a fan of music and I know that you have a lot of musical ties. He's like, let's start a label and we can put out some local releases and, and help spread the word about some local music. Mm. And so I was like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm all in on it. And we came up with the name Goodland Records from the, the Wayne's World oh, thing, yeah. Yeah. Alice Cooper. And it, it just all started snowballing. So I released a record by Tim Schweiger, who I played in the Obsoletes with. Cool. That that turned out awesome, and then we re, we released that direct hit, Jetty Boy Split Seven Inch, mm. and then all of a sudden I became really good friends with the Figs years before that, and the Figs started approaching me like, hey, do you want to put out Slow Charm on vinyl? And then Pete Donnelly was like, do you want to put out my solo record? And Mike Jones was like, do you want to put out my solo record? And then I did a fixed bo a Figs box set, wow. and so it just started snowballing, and then I released a record by Dwight Twilley. Um, who was like a 70s power pop guy cool. from the Dwight Twilley band. Right. Um, released Chicago bands, New York. I did a band out of New Orleans. Mm. So it just started snowballing, and it is what it is now. Yeah. It's had a lot of changes, and now I have a different business partner in sure. Chris Johnson. I don't know if you have met him around town. I don't before. believe so. He's, he's a lawyer in town, but he's just a bit of a socialite and oh, okay. very intapped to like the music scene here. So I figured like CJ would be a great partner to have as like the face of the Milwaukee scene for us because I, I don't live here anymore. Mm -hmm. It just worked out perfectly. That's awesome. Man, it seems a snowballing seems to become so, somewhat of a uh, trend for a lot of uh, how things manifest for you like things start off pretty like yeah this would be a cool idea like you know it's my buddies i've known for a while like yeah this seems cool and then it just turns into like you know something that a lot of different people get behind dude mm -hmm. you're you're not wrong at all that's all, yeah. which is amazing there's like a little simple twist of fate <laughs> yeah. in some of it and there's also timing yeah i think timing with with the arts and music and popular culture it, mm -hmm. it's just like it's totally the most essential thing is timing yeah you know exactly um it, but you're you're totally not wrong like <laughs> i i'm really thankful and and blessed and, and like very humbled by everything that i've been a part of i mean i was this kid from kenosha that grew up in grafton and started playing music and started playing with some of my musical idols over the years. Yeah. Right. And releasing records yeah. by bands were like, I would have loved to just gone to the store and purchased records mm. by these guys. So I'm I'm so thankful, man. And it's it's been a wild ride and I'm I'm excited for the next ten years of what yeah. good land will turn into or yeah. you know, who I'm gonna help get sober when I start working. Yeah. Which is amazing. Uh, that's like that's really awesome work that you're doing too. With that, is uh, my nice. dad is uh, on March 28th. He'll be sober for six years. Oh wow! And uh, yeah, it's you know, it can be a very like insidious journey for many people. You know. Absolutely. Yeah. Is, is he live in Illinois still? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But. You know, and he, yeah, he's he's dealt with uh, you know a lot of health challenges like over the years, like none of which are like, you know, 
too serious, but, you know, he has been challenged, and I know that, like, drinking was, like, it, I mean, it changed his entire life, you know, like, going sober, it had changed, it, like, I mean, he's still the same old lovable guy, but, yeah, like, um, you know, I, I'm actually, tonight, my last two episodes from, uh, December that I have to upload are with my mom and with my dad. Really? He'll be sharing his story. Yeah. Wow, I'm really excited for that. Oh, yeah. yeah man. I mean, even, you know, small health problems, even if you have to make a major change, like cutting something out that's yeah. that could be bad for you long or short term. Yeah, yeah like, I mean, one of the things, like, he, uh, he has, he's on a low-carb diet now because oh, okay. of his, like, uh, blood sugar, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, he... <clears throat> He's had to change his diet, you know, and I know that when he stopped drinking alcohol, like, he had, like, he started eating more, you know, and he also started drinking a lot more coffee. So, he, you know, he substituted it for something, you know. Oh, yeah. You, you kind of have to. It's like if, if you're doing something like drinking or if you're abusing a certain drug. Yeah. Or even if it's food, mm -hmm. you know, oh, yeah. or, or whatever. Whatever it is, and and also if you replace it with something, in in the program they call that cross addiction. Oh, okay. Because you're replacing something for something else, and then you abuse that item. Mm -hmm. So you know you, you you have to watch it, but there also yeah. has to be a, a bit of a reward system, especially oh, yeah. early on. Definitely. For me, when I stopped drinking, sh like sweets, yeah, were my thing. I I mean I love food in general, but yeah. like sweets and dessert like that was my thing like okay like if i make it through the entire day without drinking today then i can have like a piece of chocolate cake or a brownie or a cookie or and then i would just like go out of control but then i put on a lot of weight after i, I stopped drinking and mm -hmm. doing that reward system <laughs> yeah yeah same thing happened to him too you know like yeah there is that like it that void filling if you will um yeah yeah um, and I mean, everyone, yeah, it's, it's, it's the moder it's teaching yourself moderation and like that self-discipline and it's challenging for sure. But, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, just hearing about the fact that you're eight years sober now. That's amazing, man. Very, very yeah. Good Thank for you. you. And also six years with your father. Yeah. There's nothing to, to shake a stick at. Totally. And it's, that's huge. Yeah. Shout out to dad. Shout out to John. Uh, so, uh, my dad's name is John also. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I also wanted to say, um, a, a, my friend Mark Leitner here in town, who's also another attorney in town that I met through music. And okay. I used to work at an exclusive company oh. in Farwell. Nice. That's how I've spent a lot of money there. <laughs> Same. Yeah, right. <laughs> and made very little money <laughs> there. Yeah. Right, yeah. But my, my friend Mark... He uh, he's also in the program for something of like, God, it's got to be twenty four years by now, something mm -hmm. like that. So when I got sober, he you know I'd run into him occasionally, and, and we would talk about it and have conversations. And of course, the program is anonymous. Yeah. He's out in the open with his okay. with his sobriety, so like I I wouldn't try to pinpoint anybody yeah. and call him out by name. But he also said that when we were talking at Turner Hall at a show, I think he was probably. I don't know, 19 years sober at that point and he asked me how long I was sober and I, I was probably three years or something at that point mm -hmm. and he goes you know John like that's that's important you have to like talk about those goals and you have to take that seriously but he's like you know all that time he's like my 19 years if I don't make it through the end of the day without drinking that 19 years means shit you know mm -hmm. like he so he's like you know I've been up since 8 a.m. today and it's midnight, so you know I've, I, I've, I've really been sober sixteen hours because if I don't make it through the end of the day, then that whole nineteen years means yeah, nothing. That's quite a way to look at it, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Making every single day count, it's essential. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it sounds you know parts of the program sound very cheesy and contrived mm -hmm. at times. To some people, especially that are not in the program, from the outside looking in, and there's also like some God connotations in the in the literature. Yeah. You know, once you see past all that stuff, 
it's not about God. It's it's not about like, you know, living your best life and 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 trying to, you know, make everybody make changes around you and mm-hmm. it's it's all about like uh, of course living it day to day, but it's all about whatever in the literature that helps you make positive changes. Because Bill W. when he when he wrote the big book, he he was a super flawed man. Mm. I, I don't know if, if your dad follows the program or he uh, he hasn't for a while. Okay, but yeah. I mean, Bill W. was a very flawed man, and so when I when I look at the literature, this is a guy making this movement, not trying to like be God or like talk about God so much. I, I think he was just using a thing that worked for him and he knew that it could work for other people as well. And now like it's changed millions of people's lives. Yeah. And this is a guy that like was a philanderer and he's he's chain cigarette smoker. Um, he he was a very flawed guy. Yeah. I don't want to I don't want to say too much bad yeah. things about him, but on his deathbed, I think he got emphysema and, and cancer, and he was on his deathbed, and his wife was taking care of him, and he was apparently like the last three days he was alive, he was like begging for whiskey. Really? So a guy that wrote the big book, changed millions of people's lives, was a flawed man. He on his deathbed, he, he was begging for whiskey. You know, it just goes to show you, it's any point in your life, you can have a moment of weakness Mm -hmm. and, you know, resort to your bad vices. Yeah. There's there's also this story, and I'm sorry to veer off a little bit here, but there's an interesting story in treatment that I was told. There's this, I think it was this 80-year-old lady. Um, She was was celebrating her 80th birthday. Mm -hmm. And she was with a whole bunch of people, and apparently she got sober when she was 30. So she was celebrating her 80th birthday and 50 years sober. And her friends at this party were having champagne. And they talked her into having a glass of champagne. They're like, they're like, hey, whatever her name is, like, you can have a glass of champagne. You've gone 50 years, you know, just treat yourself. It's, you're, you're good now, you're cured. And apparently she broke down and felt pressure and drank this glass of champagne. And she ended up in treatment two weeks later. Really? So, wow. <laughs> you know, a lot, of, a lot of people ask me, they're like, you know, you've gone this far without drinking. Are you ever, you know, are you ever going to have a beer again or something? Are you going to try a glass of wine at some point? And it's like, I'm sure I can have a glass of beer or a glass of wine at some point and not go off in a tailspin. Do I, is it worth it? Is it worth like, mm-hmm. they call that further experimentation in yeah. the program? It's, it's totally like, I, it, that glass of wine or beer, it doesn't matter to me. Yeah, that's how I feel about weed. I don't smoke weed because it give me really bad anxiety and uh, oh God, yeah. It's the worst. imagine, man. Yeah. And like, like, like taking a hit of like very strong weed nowadays. Yeah. I would just be off in a field freaking out with like my crazy heartbeats. Yeah, yeah. So, and I haven't smoked weed since I was 18. And I mean, I'm 24 now, so like it's been six years. And I don't, you know, there's been people, like my friends, a lot of my friends are regular pot users, which is fine. Um, I totally, totally support that. Me but, too. but like, they've asked, like, do you think you're ever going to do it again? Or like, do you, like, Oh, like it would be so like it would be an honor if like I could smoke weed with you just one day. And and while I do appreciate the notion, I just don't see any point in it. It just it doesn't make me feel good. And it's not worth it. Totally. What you said, it's just not worth it. And it's also a very social drug. So yeah. it's not like it's not somebody trying to peer pressure you. It's you know, weed there's some people that sit at home and watch a movie and smoke weed or play video games, but it's a very like I've noticed it that that's like a, a lot of dudes like to pass a joint or a pipe or a bong. It's a very yeah. like unified yeah. kind of ritual. Mm-hmm. As is drinking. You know, yeah, you can drink of, alone of in isolation, but why is there bars? Why is it cause 
such like a social like liquid courage you know it's like yeah. a, it's a social lubricant yeah oh yeah exactly yeah. definitely yeah and you know i'm proud of myself because i've never when it's i've literally been with my friends while they're smoking weed and it's been passed to me and i'm just like nope i don't do that and they pass it to their other whoever's next and you know it's just yeah like which I'm proud of that discipline I've had for myself, you know. And everyone hats should... Hats off to you. Hey, hats off to you as well. Thanks. So, John, as we close out, because uh, we did cover a lot of ground for over an hour now. <laughs> quite some time. Uh, this is really, this is really really awesome. Get to get to know you and talk to you about all your music. and Same here. Yeah, being sober, Goodland Records, uh, Nashville, all of it. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, you bet. So, uh, John, as to close out, tell me what keeps you up at night. <clears throat> Everything that I want to do, mm-hmm. either the next day or the coming weeks. It's like, you know, when I'm sure you probably have this too, when you lay down at night. And you're you're trying to go to bed, but then you start thinking about like, okay, what groceries do I have to get tomorrow? Yeah, yeah. The racing well, thoughts at night. Yeah, yeah the, the racing thoughts. That's the thing that that keeps me up. Mm-hmm. How am I gonna have enough time before I have to like go to work or go to, you know, film podcasts? Like, am I gonna get this and this done? Like, when am I gonna fit time to do this? Absolutely. Yeah. All yeah. the time. What puts you to sleep? Um. I, you know, a lot of people say that they count sheep. I don't do that. I just try to think of what I actually got done. And I I try to think of like the positive things that Mm -hmm. I did. Yeah. Because if I don't do that, then I start thinking about negative things and that'll keep me up even longer and give me, that'll like raise my blood pressure. And yeah, I mean, it's easy to sit down in bed or lay down in bed and you're, exhausted from the day yeah. or whatever yeah but then you can be so exhausted that you can't go to sleep mm-hmm. you know yeah so I, I just try to think about like okay like I, I wrote a part of this song a great day at work today hung out with my fiance took my dog on some great walks I, I try to think of like okay I accomplished these things it's it's time to close the book now mm-hmm. and then tomorrow's a new day Absolutely. what about you for both of those Sure. Uh, so if what keeps me up at night, um, usually, uh, I'd say I sleep, generally I sleep very well, um, because of that exact thing you just said, like just being so emotionally drained from the day, like I just, usually I, I just pass out uh, with no issue, but if it is something keeping me up, it is the racing thoughts at the end of the night of like, what do I have to get done tomorrow? You know, am I going to have enough time to get everything accomplished? Mm-hmm. You know, like just the anticipation sometimes keeps me up. But what puts me to sleep? Uh, yeah, a lot of times, uh, you know, I'm up. Um, I like to watch a lot of movies and I like to, uh, you know, just. Uh, do little things that like stimulate me until I'm burned out to where like I can't you even keep my eyes. Just have to shut off. Yeah, right. I used to do that. I used to watch The Office. Yeah. Just like let the episodes roll on yeah. Netflix. Mm-hmm. And then I was just like I just enjoy that show way too much and then I would just find myself like tuning too yeah. far into it. Right. Yeah. Maybe I should watch more like boring yeah. things. Right. Or the Bob Ross. I know a lot of people like to watch Bob Ross when they because he's so something soon. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for being on the show. Thanks a lot, man. This Appreciate was, you. This was awesome. Many Meltdowns, EP, out streaming everywhere. Uh, Lim Beck, playing Milwaukee and Chicago. It's very exciting. Good Land Records, coming up on uh, 10 years. And, uh, yeah, uh, stay tuned for uh, Fresh Basil and Baby Brains. Thanks a lot for having me, man. You bet. Thanks for watching, Mr. Nice Guy. We'll see you next time. Cheers. Cheers.